On January 24, 2009, in the Spanish city of Seville, a 17-year-old girl named Martha del Castillo left to meet her boyfriend, Miguel Carcanio, as they needed to discuss some aspects of their relationship. After saying goodbye to her family, Martha left her house, never to be seen alive again. After 21 days of search, on February 13, 2009, the police finally located the alleged suspect. The young man assumed all responsibility for the case and revealed that he had gotten rid of Martha and, moreover, all the evidence regarding the case. No one imagined that this would be one of the longest, most erratic, and contradictory cases ever seen in the history of the European country, the case of Martha del Castillo. Every day we coexist with evil. We witness the darkest side of human behavior. The suffering caused by one individual to others is something inherent in our society. As dedicated investigators of the criminal world, we're on a mission to uncover the most shocking crimes and get inside the minds of those who commit them. I am Lucas, and today I bring you another unreal true crime. The Case of Martha del Castillo Martha del Castillo was born on June 19, 1991, in Seville, Spain, to Eva Casanueva and Antonio del Castillo. She was a 17-year-old adolescent, attending high school, until one day her life took a horrific turn. On January 24, 2009, Martha was chatting with Silvia Fernandez, her best friend, when suddenly Martha ended the conversation. She told her friend that she had to leave and that she was in a hurry because her boyfriend Miguel Carcanio was waiting downstairs. She needed to talk to him to clarify some things about their relationship and assured that she would tell everything when she returned. In the hallway, Martha ran into her father, who advised her not to get on Miguel's motorcycle. The only response he received from his daughter was a kiss on the cheek. At 5.30 p.m., Martha left her home, and as the hours passed, and she didn't return, her family began to worry. Her mother decided to call all acquaintances who might have information about her daughter's whereabouts, including Carcanio. The unanimous response was that Martha must be with Miguel, he must know where she was. However, after the young man did not answer the calls, Martha's father decided to approach the boy's house, repeatedly rang the bell, but no one opened the door. Eventually, they could contact someone who had seen her that night, Samuel Benitez, a close friend of Miguel. At that moment, Martha's mother perceived the first strange situation. The young man told her that Miguel had left Martha at his house at midnight, which was impossible, as it was only 11.45. At two in the morning, Martha's family finally reported her disappearance, but they never suspected that it would become one of the most publicized cases in the country's history. Four hours later, the details of who was already a suspect, Martha's boyfriend Miguel Carcanio, were provided. At 1.30 p.m., a third report was filed. The police did not take action, and the family became increasingly impatient. Only 17 hours after the first request for help, as established by the protocol, the officers began searching for Martha. In the days following the disappearance, the family decided to take statements from relatives and friends of the young girl. On January 27, 2009, the first press conference was held, while the parents started a campaign to find the young girl. The following day, 2,000 people protested in Seville, calling for the young girl's return, under the slogan, We Are All Martha. On February 7, another demonstration was convened, gathering about 3,000 people. The case echoed on television and in newspapers. After 21 days of searching, on February 13, the police finally located Miguel Carcanio. The 20-year-old assumed all responsibility for the case, stating he had murdered Martha and dumped her body into the Guadalquivir River. 
very close to his apartment. He also shared a crucial piece of information. He didn't commit the atrocious acts alone. He identified Sanduel Benitez as one of his accomplices, claiming he helped dispose of the body. Benitez accepted the blame. Later, Miguel identified Javier Garcia Marin, a problematic miner known as El Cuco, and Francisco Delgado, Carcano's brother, and his girlfriend, Maria Garcia, as accomplices. All five were arrested. The interrogations led to a wave of contradictions, and simultaneously, the meticulous search for Martha's body in the river commenced. On February 16, Carcano reiterated his statement in front of a judge. Unlike his friend Samuel, who wanted nothing to do with the case, he assured he had not been involved in Martha's murder and only confessed due to police harassment. On March 18, Miguel Carcano requested to make another statement and changed his version of events, claiming both he and El Cuco abused Martha at knife point, after which the miner strangled her. They then took her body to Delgado's house and later threw it into a garbage container. Following these declarations, the judge ordered the suspension of the search in the Guadalquivir River and directed the search to a landfill. Martha's father even accused Delgado's girlfriend, as her father worked at a biological waste crematorium. He speculated that the body might have been incinerated. This theory gained media traction, but the police continued their search. On November 16, 2009, El Cuco exceeded the maximum term for preventive detention and was transferred to a supervised flat awaiting trial. In February 2011, he was tried again, this time for abuse and murder. However, due to insufficient evidence, he was acquitted of these charges but was sentenced to two years and 11 months in a juvenile detention center for covering up for Carcanio. On October 17, 2011, the trial finally commenced against the four adult defendants involved in the case. Miguel Carcanio provided more details about Martha's murder, stating he had hit her with an ashtray during a heated argument, causing her death. He revealed his previous statements about abusing her were lies. His brother, his brother's girlfriend, and Benitez claimed innocence and professed ignorance about the location of Martha's body, asserting Carcanio fabricated stories to lessen his guilt. By November 22, 2011, the forensic police confirmed that they had found traces of Martha's blood on Miguel's jacket and a mix of his and Maria Garcia's genetic profiles on a roll of fabric tape. DNA from Francisco Delgado and the aforementioned woman was also found on an extension cable, believed to have been used to strangle Martha. This was unusual as the accused kept insisting that she had only been at the crime scene in the early morning and was unaware of the entire incident. After uncovering the lie, Maria Garcia was accused of desecrating the body and cover-up. The police also detected up to five fingerprints on three alcohol bottles, one belonging to El Cuco, the only one against whom there was no evidence was Benitez. By this point, the five youths were already under the scrutiny of the entire population. The initial trials were held with substantial police presence, and the prosecution assigned prison years for Carcanio, Benitez, Delgado, and Garcia, involving a total of 90 witnesses, including national police officers and experts. The assistance of 30,000 phone monitorings, crime scene photographs, DNA found by the forensic police, and items found at the house located at Leon 13 were considered. The trials had created such a public uproar that people pressed against the police cordon to receive the accused, loudly demanding the appearance of Martha's body. Delgado and his girlfriend appeared covered with balaclavas and sunglasses, but they still couldn't escape the crowd. A lady approached them and started insulting them. Other people tried to remove their glasses while pushing them so that everyone could see their faces. During the trial, El Cuco's mother was interviewed, her face covered. She asserted her son's innocence and claimed neither she nor he knew anything about Martha's body. She was labeled a liar by journalists but didn't care. She still received a sum of 10,000 euros for being interviewed. A few days later, Martha's family asked that her earnings from the program be regulated 
and that the money be used to face her son's sentence. During the proceedings, a key witness appeared, the taxi driver who transported Delgado on the night of the crime. He stated that he was very attentive to the passengers he picked up, as a colleague had been murdered while working recently. He remembered picking up a bald man with a beard, matching Delgado's description, who had a plastic bag, and looked at him very intently. He took him to Leon 13th Street, precisely where the crime had occurred, and the charge was 8 euros. However, Delgado's defense lawyer questioned this evidence, claiming the fare for the two kilometers covered in those years should have been 5 euros, not 8, thus discrediting the statement. When Martha's parents took the stand, they mentioned the profound pain the situation was causing. They had to quit their jobs, start psychiatric medications, and even develop depression. Their other two daughters, Martha's sisters, were also going through a horrible time. They just wanted everything to end. To add to the pain, the jury's verdict in January 2012 didn't satisfy the family. Carcanio ended up as the sole responsible party for the young girl's murder and was sentenced to 21 years and three months in prison. Additionally, for the next 30 years, he is banned from residing in the city where the victim's parents and sisters live. At the same time, Carcanio should pay part of the trial costs and compensate the victim's parents with 280,000 euros and each of her sisters with 30,000 euros for the moral damage caused by Martha's murder and disappearance. Meanwhile, Delgado, Maria Garcia, and Samuel Benitez were released as there was no evidence placing them at the crime scene at the time of the murder. The following year, Delgado and Benitez demanded Martha's family pay for the trial costs. Martha's father stated he would seek justice beyond national borders as he believed the system in Spain was obsolete. He even claimed he would go to Strasbourg, home to the European Parliament and the European Court of Human Rights. In December 2011, Martha's mother wrote a letter to Carcanio and sent it to prison, asking him to end the torture of uncertainty she felt due to the absence of her daughter's body. She wanted Martha to rest in peace in a place where she could bring her flowers and talk to her. However, the letter never received a response. On January 24, 2012, three years after Martha's disappearance, demonstrations occurred in various cities and towns in Spain, demanding justice for the young girl. In prison, Carcanio was threatened by other inmates and later attempted suicide. He was admitted to a therapeutic module and did not receive visitors or talk to anyone on the phone. The young murderer was very busy during his imprisonment, creating up to seven different versions of the crime, leading to several lawyers resigning from defending him. The latest version, in 2013, implicated someone close to him as the perpetrator of the crime. Carcanio spoke of an argument between him and his brother over the mortgage for the house at Leon 13. He sent a letter to the family expressing his wish to stop covering for Delgado. According to this version, a fight ensued over a fraudulent loan. The conversation escalated to the point that Delgado threatened his brother with a weapon. When Martha tried to intervene, she allegedly received a fatal blow with the butt of Delgado's gun. Delgado then made a call, and Miguel claims he doesn't know who it was directed to or what was discussed, but he remembers that he then ran out of the house, leaving Martha lifeless in the room. It was then that El Cuco arrived, and Miguel asked for his help to dispose of the body using a wheelchair. They transported the body to the Mahaloba farm in La Rinconada and buried it there. Martha's parents believed Carcanio's version and held him in high esteem despite everything that had happened. They requested the reopening of the investigation, focusing on Miguel's brother this time. However, neither the prosecution nor the judge gave weight to the statements. Martha's father decided to visit Carcanio in prison himself, asking him to collaborate. He even told him he had bought the house at Leon 13 and that it would be his after serving his sentence if he helped find his daughter's body. The search for Martha's body was one of the most expensive in the country's history, encompassing both land and sea to locate the young girl. The first search was conducted in the Guadalquivir River. However, 
Several inconsistencies were found when agents tried to recreate the transfer from Leon 13's floor. It was impossible for three people, in this case, El Cuco, Carcanio, and Benitez, to transport together on a motorcycle, especially carrying Martha's body. In the reenactment, the body fell to the ground the moment the engine started, when Carcanio claimed that the body had been thrown in a trash bin. The search began in the landfill that receives all the waste from Seville. Due to the time elapse since the young girl's disappearance and the vast amount of waste received by the landfill, the search team estimated they would have to remove around 40,000 tons of garbage to obtain some result. They searched for a total of 32 days without success. The accused mentioned up to four different locations where the body was, prompting new searches each time. On one occasion, the then Interior Minister, Alfredo Perez, had to pause the search as the Ministry of Economy and Finance was running out of funds. In April 2013, after pointing to his brother as Martha's real murderer, Carcanio gave a new location for the body near the municipality of La Rinconada. Despite losing almost all credibility after so many false versions, a new search was decided upon. Carcanio accompanied the police officers to where he claimed to have buried Martha's body along with Delgado on that night in 2009. He did not give precise directions. He only sketched the area where he believed they had dumped the body. The soil of six farms was excavated, focusing on points where, according to a study done with a Jorodar, there had been earth movements in recent years. In total, an area of 10,000 square meters was scanned, but again nothing was found. All the searches were in vain. At the request of the parents, the search for the body was halted until 2015. The public ministry asked the defendants to jointly compensate the Ministry of the Interior with a sum of 616,319 euros, the approximate cost of the search, but this never happened. Fortunately, other doubts in the case were resolved, thanks to a very special collaborator. In February 2009, Oscar presented himself to Rosolia, Cuco's mother, as a criminal, but in reality, he was an infiltrator seeking a confession simple words that could shed some light on Martha's whereabouts. Over time, they began to meet frequently, seeing each other every two or three days, and talk daily on the phone. Roselia trusted him with the keys to her house. They shared confidences, took long walks on the beach. He gained her trust, and won her over. He even made her believe that they would leave together for some country in Eastern Europe once everything ended for her son. For two and a half years, Oscar recorded 600 hours of conversation between Rosalia and her surroundings. In October 2011, El Cuco was already granted release permits from the juvenile center to which he had been sent for covering up for Carcanio. During a conversation, Oscar asked the young man if he thought the police were following him, to which El Cuco responded affirmatively, asserting they would do so to find out where they got rid of Martha. This statement forever incriminated him. After finishing talking, El Cuco immediately realized what he had said and quickly rectified, asserting he hadn't done anything, while Oscar played along as if he hadn't noticed. In other tapes, El Cuco mocked the police's efforts to find the body, and Roselia discussed how inept the investigators had been for not auditing the calls from her mobile phone. Despite the hard work of the man, those 600 hours of recordings were never judicialized. Only in 2022, 13 years after Martha's disappearance, did the infiltrator's work yield results. On May 26, 2022, dozens of people, especially neighbors of Martha's family, gathered at the courthouse doors wanting to accompany them due to the celebration of the new judicial process. Roselia and El Cuco arrived at the courthouse shielded by the police. The young man was entirely covered, wearing a large hoodie, a balaclava, sunglasses, and even gloves. Roselia was wearing sunglasses, a mask, and a headscarf. In 2011, El Cuco declared that he had not been in the flat on Leon 13th Street, where the crime occurred, but with several friends. He said he had gone home at 11.30 at night and had met his mother's partner, who had gone out to throw out the garbage. 
then had gone up to his house and had not left for the rest of the night. Rosalia, for her part, said she had gone out with her partner for drinks around 11.30 at night and had returned home around 1.30 in the morning on January 25, finding her son asleep there. El Cuco confessed that on the night of January 24, Carcanio called him after having murdered Martha and asked him for help to bury her body. Along with Benitez, they took his mother's car and went to Leon 13, where Delgado was also found. Meanwhile, Roselia was at the bar and stayed there until 4.30 in the morning. When she got home, her son was still missing. Both El Cuco and his mother were charged with perjury, the act aggravated by having obstructed the judicial procedure ongoing since 2009. Both El Cuco and Roselia accepted responsibility for their acts. The trial was held, and the judge suspended all scheduled witness statements, leaving Martha's parents distressed as they had called Carcanio to testify in hopes he would finally reveal their daughter's whereabouts. On June 9, 2022, both El Cuco and Rosalia were sentenced to two and a half years in prison, and the judge also imposed a fine of 1,000 440 euros each, and a civil liability payment of 30,000 euros to Martha's parents. However, they didn't care about the money. They still wanted just one thing, to find the body of their daughter. That same year, the investigative judge authorized the expert to access the mobile phones of Carcanio and Martha. However, he did not grant permission to do the same with the rest of the individuals involved in the case as there currently is no evidence against them. Carcanio consented to his phone being examined, insisting they would find evidence pointing to his brother as the actual murderer. Yet the main goal was to determine the location of the long-sought body. Although looking for new leads in the criminal case was prohibited, the expert never submitted his findings, and thus, the case was closed indefinitely. In November 2022, 13 years after Martha's murder, the civil court decided to close the separate investigation for the search of the body, deeming the legally stipulated investigation period as expired without any new significant discoveries. Martha's parents came to terms with the fact that Carcanio would never reveal the location of their daughter's body and decided to sell the flat where the crime occurred. Martha's case will join countless other unresolved cases worldwide, with documents gathering dust on a desk. That's all for today's episode. Don't forget to subscribe, hit the like button, and leave your comments, always with respect for the family of the victim. This is Unreal True Crime. See you soon.